In this episode, we're talking with Jill Garner, who is the Victorian government architect. And we're going to explore why our government seem to have such difficulty in delivering on the housing targets that they themselves set. We're going to get an insider's perspective on why increasing supply is not as easy as it sounds, and we're keen to understand whether it is possible to quickly increase density without sacrificing good urban planning and design. Welcome to The Elephant in the Room. This is the podcast where we love to talk about the big things in property that never usually get talked about. I'm Veronica Morgan, real estate agent, buyer's agent and buyer's agent mentor, co-host of Foxtel's Location, Location, Location Australia, author of Auction Ready and co-host of Your First Home Buyer Guide. And I'm Chris Bates, mortgage broker, recently ranked number five in Australia out of over 18,000 brokers in the annual MPA Top 100 Mortgage Broker Award. Before we get started, I need to let you know that nothing we say here can be taken as personal advice. We always recommend you engage the services of an appropriate and experienced professional. Our guest today is Jill Garner, a highly respected architect with 40 years experience extending across practice and government. Jill became the first woman Victorian government architect in 2015 and as an advocate for architecture and design in state government, she leads a small team of experts promoting the value of contextual, integrated design thinking and a collaborative approach across design disciplines. Now, she is not just a public servant, as she also maintains a role in architectural practice. Her practice is Garner Davis Architects, uh, and they have received numerous industry awards for delivering sensitive, crafted public and private work. She's also an alumni of the innovative practice-based Masters by Design, RMIT, and she's taught at both RMIT and Melbourne universities, is a past board member and examiner for the Architects Registration Board, Victoria. She chaired the Australian Committee for the 2018 Venice Architecture Biennale. She is a life fellow of the Australian Institute of Architects and in 2022 was awarded the President's Prize. But if that is not enough, in 2021, Jill was appointed member, Order of Australia, recognising her distinguished service to architecture, education and professional associations. I have been stalking Jill for so long to come on the podcast. I don't normally read the whole bio, but I have today because we are honoured to have you to join us. Thanks so much for coming along. But You're really welcome, Veronica. Very happy to be here. Jill, it's a very interesting conversation, to be honest. And when Veronica booked it, there's lots of questions already popping into my head. And uh, let's just start with the obvious one that what is a government architect and what's sort of your role with the Victorian government? I, I guess historically the government architect has been the head of the public works. You know, years ago, government used to deliver schools, houses, hospitals, etc. And that was actually a design job in government. And that's, you know, really Australia was built on the public works in each particular state. And some of our finest buildings were delivered by the public works and the government architect was head of that particular organisation. Since um, about oh, the 80s, that role hasn't existed as such. And particularly in Victoria, I think it's a different circumstance in New South Wales, but in Victoria, there hasn't been a head of the public works in that way for a really long time. There hasn't been a public works in that way for a really long time. So what I do is I'm an advocate really and an advisor in government, obviously from an architectural background, but what I bring is my my knowledge of industry. I know how much it costs to build something. I know how hard it is to navigate uh, regulations, planning, building, you name it. I know how hard it is to build, you know, to define a brief Uh, design something that's highly complex. So I'm here in government as someone who understands the design industry to be um, probably a a helpful voice for the design industry when they're trying to navigate those in government that don't understand or don't speak the same language or perhaps have different priorities. You know, priorities in government are not necessarily about design and what it might bring to the community. They're obviously concerned about community outcomes, but how do you get there? And my argument is always, you you know, you have the same amount of concrete, the same amount of glass, the same amount of steel in any project. One can be designed well, one can simply be designed poorly, and the poor one, we just want to pull it down in 20 years' time. 
And so I'm interested in legacy. And that's a really interesting question in particular in the current climate when there's so much pressure on supply and targets. And there's a number of different, uh, I guess, departments in government and also the, the various levels of government too. So everyone's talking, or politicians are talking supply. It seems to be everyone's talking supply, but there's a role at each level of government plays and then within each government I would imagine there's various roles um, and, and by inference I guess affordability that that leads to as well right so can you sort of expand a little of our understanding of what's happening behind the uh, the curtain of government <laughs> uh, where do you start where do, you where start? do I start <laughs> uh, you know I th- I think having come from industry and from private practice and stepping into the hallowed halls of government it's been a really interesting learning curve for me and I think everybody in government works really hard (laughs) at trying to get to really good outcomes they are not led necessarily by the things that my industry or my background or my love of design or my equating design and amenity with a good life That's not necessarily on everybody's agenda, that issue of how much does it cost? How fast can we do it? How quickly can we roll this out? That's very much, you know, time and cost are the the sort of two main pillars that I see in government. That issue of quality is one that I think I'm here waving the flag for it a lot. But that's not to say it's not understood because really, and my argument is if we're building anything that needs to be retrofitted, um, changed, amended, or in the worst case demolished within, uh, you know, within a lifetime, mm. that's a really questionable invent- investment. So, uh, in reality, what we have to do is introduce that argument about balance between quality, between cost, between time. How do we make those three pillars that government really needs to be committed to? How do we balance them? And to your point, Veronica, how do we balance them in a time where our construction industry is under incredible pressure? The cost of building is extraordinary. The cost of trade, labour, is really extraordinary. Cost of building materials is extraordinary. And um, we've also we're building a lot of stuff at the moment, but it's not necessarily just housing. Here in Victoria, we're building a lot of infrastructure. We're building a lot of roads, rails, all of that kind of stuff. And we've got a limited market of people who can do it. There's limited resources. That's what I was thinking of, like, you're working at the state government. How does it work in Victoria with the sort of local governments and their, I guess, goals and what they want to do for their individual communities and what their residents want versus you know, another suburb and what that council wants. Is it, you're finding that the issue around residential is that it's a very local based thing and they all have different views? I, I think I could probably say that that if I can call it neighbourhood quality and that perception of what people love about yep. the place where they live does vary from, from um, local government to local government and, you know, what makes the city of Port Phillip loved by its residents is quite different to what makes the city of Burundara loved by its residents. So local government are in a fantastic position to understand what that is. You know, they know their local place, they know their local constituency, they know their local community and their values. But I suppose one of the problems is that our community doesn't know what it doesn't know. Most of us don't know what we don't know. And so how do do we shift headspace um, to accepting, for instance, that we need a slightly higher density suburb than what we've got at the moment? Mm. How do we get our communities to say, you know, that's okay. It's okay that there's a few more people living in the place I love to live. It's not just mine. So uh, yeah, local government has to navigate that issue that they are representing their own constituency state governments representing the whole state and I guess can bring in that idea of recommend recommendations and big ambitions and even saying to local government, you know, every single one of you 
need to bump up your numbers of homes that you have. So start identifying the places in your local um, context that can handle higher density. You know, where are the places that you've got schools, that you've got community services, you've got shops, you've got health services, you've got transport. Those areas are already serviced. Let's bump up the people who can take advantage of those services. So, you know, to answer your question, local and state have to work very closely together and each need to recognise probably the um, the limitations or the, the possibilities that's attached to the role of each. And there's pretty good relationships, I think, between state and local. There's a similar situation in Victoria where the state governments may be being a little bit more heavy-handed with the local governments to say, look, like you say, density targets need to go up. We do need to start building more uh, homes for people in areas that they want to live, not just greenfield estates and high density. So is that a similar rhetoric going on in Melbourne? And uh, Identical, yeah. yeah. And, and uh, you know, if you drill right down to that, it makes complete sense because if we keep building, Melbourne is a huge sprawling city. The outer suburbs... Every time you build a road, it costs government money. It doesn't cost the local community money. So in reality, the, the and there's no public transport, we have to kind of extend all the networks. There's no schools, there's no health services. So the infrastructure that goes with a greenfield suburb is astronomical in comparison to densifying those places where particularly in Melbourne, we've got this extraordinary tram network where there's these corridors of trams that go out probably 15 kilometres out of the city. That's a lot of land that's really heavily serviced. And there's a lot of, um, there's still a lot of empty sites or underutilised sites along those corridors. So I, I guess I would say maybe state government is a bit braver than local government. I think we all know that we need to um, build more homes. And I think state government has really just, they're prompting and saying it's time everybody took a bit of responsibility for adding to this um, this target that we're all getting to. And, we, and one party can't do it without the other. And in fact, because government doesn't build anymore, you also have to get the private sector on, on line and you know, you have to get your developers online. You've got to get them wanting to be part of the whole ambition. And that's that's really, I'd love to sort of expand this conversation to that because that's that's a key part of it, isn't it? Because, you know, just because there's a ministerial announcement of a housing target, it doesn't mean that immediately, oh, all of a sudden we've got all these um, properties, these new dwellings, but also the councils, they might decide, they might rezone areas or they might sort of put, put in place a master plan um, that allows for that. It says yes, we've met our targets, but they still don't actually build anything. So where's the gap here? What's where, where's the disconnect? I, I actually think at the moment. Um, I mean, obviously, building takes a really long time. Uh, any any project takes a long time. If I if right from the start of someone saying, oh, I think I'll build, you know, twelve homes on this double block, you've got to get the design involved. You've got to get the all the regulatory things involved. There's so many parties involved in that. You've got to get the bank involved. You've got to get finance involved. The bank's got to like your idea and be prepared to support it. You've got land holding costs that you have to pick, you know, put that into the, the equation. It's such a long process. And then also to build. Remember, we still build to, for the most part out of a stick and a nail. You know, we, we're still really not, you know, if we look internationally, we're not manufacturing. And if we look internationally, some of the more advanced, if I can call them advanced manufacturing countries, they are they're putting up an incredible amount of residential housing, say, because they've got a componentized method of building um, robots, um, factories, you know, delivery delivery on site. And I'm not talking necessarily about modular. I'm kind of talking about componentized. Think Ikea, you know, yeah. a whole house 
broken down into the component parts and literally assembled on site in um, you know, a few months in comparison to two years or whatever it takes to stick build. So that that issue of really how long it takes from start to finish of a construction project, and that's not even taking into account changing the planning rules um, and saying, well, actually, at the moment, you're only allowed to build two stories here, but we're going to let you build three or four or, or whatever. That's huge. I was doing a little bit of digging about it, Jill, before this episode, and uh, it seems you worked on this future homes project in Victoria. And I know New South Wales government are thinking about this patent book designs that before my day, that was obviously something that people used to build out of these, uh, you know, you pick your design of your home and it would be out of a small little book, I guess. But uh, what's the success of that been like in Victoria? And, you know, have we moved to society about we want everything designed our way and it, it's hard to get people to go back to to picking something that other people are going to pick? I, I think um, the, the whole ambition behind Future Homes was exactly to what I was talking about, what we call the middle ring suburbs. Yeah. And those middle ring suburbs have got reasonable scale blocks of land and they have a single, some of them a single home on them, a lot of which is part past its use by date. So what do we do with it with somewhere that's past its use by date? It maybe was built in the 30s or 40s. Um, it's on a huge block of land. There's one, sometimes there's one resident still living in it and the house is falling down. Like what do, what do we do with those blocks? So the idea of our, our um, ambition for it was to say, if we take, say, a double block, and we just used a double block as an example, could we, instead of just building, having two homes on that block, could we go to 12 homes or 15 homes on that block that actually embed amenity? I mean, anyone can build an apartment block on that double block, but our concern was the quality of the home. So it becomes not just a, oh, this will do me till I can afford the house. It's something that becomes a bit more of a forever home or or a, a home for a particular part of your life. Mm -hmm. Um and the idea was to introduce real amenity, so garden on the site. So the site is not just car park underground. There's garden, there's real trees, there's sunshine into your living area. There is outlook into, into open space. There might be some shared amenity on site, but there is amenity on site. And you're not just crammed into um, a shoebox with a whole lot of other people that you see as temporary. So we, we, our idea was that on a typical double suburban block, you could design something that in fact wasn't frightening to neighbours, it fitted into the local context, it was sort of um, pitched at the local materials, the local scale, that sort of thing, it kept the treed idea of the neighbourhood, all that kind of stuff. We've had to re and and we also the other thing that was a, the idea behind it is it's got a fast track planning process, so you can get your planning permit in about four months rather than potentially a year plus going to VCAT with neighbour complaints and all that sort of stuff. So the idea is to make it a an exercise in facilitation, and what we did was we've got four template designs, but you don't have to stick to the template. So if I'm a designer, I can actually say, well, I really like this cluster model and I'm going to use my own interpretation of that particular model, but I want to do the same type of amenity and it gets checked, it gets judged on are you delivering equivalent amenity and can you get this fast track planning process, even though you're not the original author of one of those four different possibilities that represent future homes. Now, it was introduced to the planning scheme in September last year. And it's so, you know, to my point of things taking a while to, um, to kind of roll out, we've got a group, we've got, I think about seven are being negotiated at the moment, which is fantastic, a fantastic sort of um, start of interest. In a way, with these things, you need a few built before you can say, "Why is this different to a normal, a normal developer-driven um, apartment block?" 
And until one is built and we can stand people in the space and say, look, you actually get aspect north and east, or you get aspect north and south, and you get cross ventilation, and you get a bit of sunshine, and you get a garden outlook, that kind of thing. So until you can put people in the space to say, this is different, and this is why, it's very difficult for um, for it to sell as a different a different concept in a way. So we're quite um, it's there. It's 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 just bubbling away with interest rising, and we are. I don't know that it's been um, communicated in a way to my industry, to the design industry, how flexible it is. And I've had some feedback suggesting, oh, this is very inflexible, we have to use someone else's design. Whereas in reality, what it's about is a type and you just pull out that type and you say, this is what I what I would like to to do. Do you think it's like the Nightingale success down in Victoria? Have you know much about that? And they're sort of, uh, you know, they had a project and, you know, that went well and they did another project. Now all of a sudden they've got tens of projects from my understanding that have yeah, people have seen it, felt it. They've gone to an open home, and now they've almost got momentum behind. And everyone is like a, yeah, a whole uh, desire to be part of the the movement. Yeah, it's exactly right. And I think the embedded in the Nightingale model is that issue that I'm talking about about amenity. You know, they're 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 basically they have a philosophical position that's about um, sustainability. They cater for bike riders. They are not completely dictated to by the car, so they're not they're not parking. Most of them have no parking um, on the site, so they're close to railway stations and things like that. So those sorts of um, principles, I guess, that are embedded in that project, they're absolutely applicable principles across so many sites that say are close to transport. Why are we building two car parks per dwelling for people who? Don't some people who don't have cars? So there's some challenges, I think, on what is con- what's conceived to be typical, and you're dealing with a, a, a actually you're dealing, I think, with a younger generation, or sometimes in Nightingale's case, a slightly older generation who've actually passed through this idea of I've got to live on a single block within a house, and they've come to a different position in their life. Because obviously as our cities grow, uh, except for Melbourne maybe, they can keep growing outwards, but with with the inherent cost that goes with that, um, as our cities grow in density, then people get more used to living in apartment-style arrangements or townhouses and and obviously the less need, reliance on cars, the less need for them as you're closer to everything. But um, the thing is, sorry, the big emphasis, emphasis seems to be really around rezoning and if you rezone, it will happen. And I think we all know it won't, but I guess what is uh, is there any evidence at all? I guess that you're aware of where rezoning does improve housing affordability, and if it doesn't, where is it really? Where is it going wrong? In or where is it not going far enough? Uh, look, you're probably stepping into territory that I'm not exactly an expert on because obviously zoning is a, a planning discipline. Mm-hmm. Um, you are absolutely right, though. You can't just say. We open up the floodgates and it will happen Mm. because any kind of shift needs um, an understanding. And back to Chris's comment before about touching and feeling and understanding what it's like to live in a four-storey building um, as distinct from a single house on a single lot, there's, there's a lot of education needed. I think Sydney has got a history of apartments, which is quite different to Melbourne's. So I think we have more of a challenge on our hands because we, as you say, we've got a topography. We don't have any topography, so we can just keep on going. And I think that's what we've been doing. And there are some very interesting suburbs that were that were built in, say, the um, 30s, 40s, 50s in Melbourne where apartments were the norm. And they're really desirable places to live because they're busy and they're populous and they tend to have good streetscape because they're interesting buildings. And it's it, it's 
it's something that exists in a certain part of our population, but it's not well well known. So we're, we, we have got a challenge on our hands in Melbourne to shift the idea of living on a site with more than your own immediate nuclear family and what does that look like and feel like. I like to think there's a, a generational shift in that. Yeah. And, and earlier you were talking about the future homes and, and some level of resistance, so I guess is it's you've got seven being considered at the moment, but you know, as you say, until it's it that you can feel it, touch it, see it, be in it, you you can't sort of say, Yes, this works and see how. Um is that the resistance is it at the consumer end or is it um, both at the consumer end and the developer end because the developer perceives the resistance at the consumer end? Uh, I think there's uh, lots of things at play. I think it's a different model. You know, it, it, building in the green fields, um, to Chris's point before, a pattern book has always been part of our green fields development. You just go, I'll have display home type A or I'll have display home type Z. But in fact, they don't have Z. They really have A, B, C, and D. And each of those four fit on a site in a particular yep. way. And you kind of choose it off the shelf and you know what you're getting. So that is, I mean, in, in itself, that is a pattern book approach. And, and in a way, it's never been any different. That's what a terrace house is. You know, that was yep. just bought across from England and put on put on our sites here here in Australia. Um, but the other challenge we've got at the moment is what it costs to build. And I think if I my our future homes challenge is more that we started developing it just before COVID hit and we ran right through COVID and then all of a sudden construction costs went up by 40%. And so the difference in something that's stacked up in 2020 and something that we're trying to make up make stack up now is quite it's chalk and cheese so what are the what are the value management processes that need to come into play so that we um, allow them to happen so I think I think that problem of construction cost is huge what what I do know is going on in Melbourne I'm quite sure this is the same in Sydney is that we have a lot of planning permits that have been granted and they haven't started and they've been sitting there for two or three years and the, I presume the owners, the developers are just not game do them. They're not, they're not game release them. They're not game borrow the money uh, and they're sitting on the site and the permit. I'm on a personal mission to help more people make better property decisions and you can find out all about what I'm working on at veronicamorgan.com.au. There you will find resources for first home buyers, details about my buyer's agent mentoring program, information about my newest project, Preferential, Proactive Property Management in Sydney, or if you're looking to buy your dream home or investment property in Sydney's inner west, eastern suburbs or lower north shore, you can connect with my team at Good Deeds Property Buyers. And if you'd like a 30% discount plus free postage for my book, Auction Ready, How to Buy Property at Auction, even though you're scared shitless and yes, I'm a potty mouth, use the code ELEPHANT at the checkout. If you're looking to buy your first home, thinking of upgrading to a new home or purchasing an investment property anywhere in Australia, we would love to carefully guide you through this journey and importantly, get the finance right. Please reach out to myself and the team at flintgroup.au. They're going to well, be a little bit patient though, because I mean, I, you wouldn't take risk if you're a developer, right? Unless you, you know, particularly that you, a lot of your liquidity buffers have been burnt. Do you think this is um, the government's got a I think uh, you know part to play here? The amount of uh, the north uh, east west link, you know, you've got the metro going on. There's so much going on at the government level in Victoria that you know they need to wait for some of their resources to come back online and that are you know for them to actually build these things at a better price. Or what? What do you think? I um I think we've got to all get used to how much it costs. I don't I don't think construction costs are going to come down. It's a matter of us our headspace catching up with construction costs. Um I think yeah developers won't take a risk at the moment, but I think one of the things that government is looking at doing and I think this is there's something fantastic embedded in this proposition is that government is a big land ho holder and a big owner of land. Um, so that idea of partnering 
with those that um, that have trouble with land or, or that perhaps the land holding costs tip their equation into being impossible. If, you know, if there was some kind of way of navigating land holding costs, and I don't know whether I'm not an economist, I presume that means the banks need to come on board in some way to say, we're not going to charge you something on this site, or there's certain taxes on this site, or there's certain costs on this site. We're not going to make you pay them until construction starts. Because sometimes a, a developer will be sitting on a site. Imagine sitting on a site for five years and paying land holding costs and and then watching the construction market climb in terms of costs. It's just a no-win situation. So there's something on the money side and the land holding side and that maybe the tax side with that as well. But that's also tied into what's happening in the property market because you've got a situation in Melbourne at the moment, very flat market. You know, some segments are actually in, in decline. And so, again, that's not going to give developers a huge amount of confidence to actually break ground, is it? Um, but then you've got the other side of that, which is the land banking side. You know, so you, you, not every developer is sitting there bleeding because of holding costs. So some developers are actually being more opportunistic and saying, well, actually, I'm not going to, I'm going to try and time it so that when, if I'm going to, if I'm, I've only got one opportunity to maximize my profit from this site, you know, and so I'm going to choose my moment to, to do that. And, and I'm going to wait. And if there's a possibility, I might be able to get more on it. Or if there's a possibility that prices are going to rise, I'm going to get a better outcome in, in terms of my result, sales results. They're going to hold off. And in fact, I mean, I've heard anecdotally some stories about with rezoning where developers who have been sitting on land for a period of time and they fit more in the land banking category, they then just get an approval for a much, you know, greater amount of, of dwellings on the site. The, the site's automatically worth more and they just sell they sell the site with the approvals, you know what I mean? So it's not necessarily um, – there's other things at play. I mean, that's what's happening, right, in, in some that, – Yeah, I was actually going to say exactly that, that um, we are seeing quite a lot of projects where a developer is pushing for extra yield, considerably more yield, and, um, you know, navigating their way through a planning process and being given more yield because – I guess one of the arguments is we need more housing, so therefore give us this permit and we'll build more. And yep, they then flip the site with this huge extra yield on it, which has come out of all sorts of promises. And they and the, and you know there there are a certain number of um, I imagine property owners who do there might be some professional property flippers these days rather than than Develop. you know that taking the risk of going into development if you can make a huge profit from navigating the planning system and navigating this sort of housing shortage that we've got and all of those crises that go with that the perceived crises that go with it um, it's much easier to sell it to someone else and just pocket the profit if you're lucky enough to have managed to get a really good yield out of the site. Julia, Scott, um, you made a interesting point before, which I hadn't thought of in Melbourne before, where, yes, they've got a, a great trade network. You can't knock that, right? It's getting better with the Metro. Um, you're doing some big, you know, big plans in the future with the outer ring. I'm, I'm not exactly sure where that's at, but you've got the tram network. Do you think that Melbourne's like such a well-positioned where, you know, Sydney's retrofitting trams, right? We, we took them away and now we're putting it back in. But um, do you think that that's something that Melbourne's got that gives it a lot more options because of that tram? Because, you know, they can be so, they're so well linked to the trains as well. Like I just hadn't thought it, it just gives so many options of where you could actually build a lot more density than say in Sydney, where we do want to have those train lines. That's exactly right. I mean, what we've got is, as I say, up to sort of 15 kilometres all the way around the city, Yep. We've got this extraordinary tram network. And um, if you think about it, they go down shopping streets. Mm. A lot of the shopping streets are one story and individual small shops, but they're local neighbourhoods um, and there's a tram stop every 500 metres. And so if you think about that in terms of catchment, you've got these linear catchments of people who anyone on a tram line does not need a car, really. 
And I, I think Melbourne, I really think we have the most extraordinary, that's, I guess, um, one of the networks we've got. It's a really safe network as well, because you are up above the ground, you've got a driver, you've got, um, it's busy, it operates quickly. Um, it's stuck on the road, I guess. So it's always trams do have to navigate um, cars as well, though we've got a couple of light rails that have their own corridors, but usually they're navigating cars, which makes life a little bit slow. But if you think about that network and bumping up the density in linear rather than, you know, centralised things around stations, mm. but you have you do have the stations and then you've got this linear corridors that is the second kind of layer of density. And, you know, if you, I, I think City of Melbourne did a study at one stage saying that they believed that if we went to, say, four storeys along our tram networks, they did, a, a, you know, some figures to say this is how many houses we could actually put along these kind of um, tram corridors if we, if we really did, did take that very seriously. You're relying once again on local government to accept, because obviously a tram goes right through, might go through six different local governments. And so each of those players has to come on board and be part of a bigger conversation about, okay, this tram goes all the way from Port Melbourne to Box Hill, which is our probably our longest tram. What does that look like the whole way? Rather than being, you know, high at one end, high somewhere in the middle where you hit Box Hill, um, what does it look like when it's going through the areas that are only one story, but but have got a very busy tram network on them? So what could that look like? So there's a lot of players that can come on board and be part of this layered answer. It's quite fascinating, isn't it, when you when you sort of dig into d different cities too and how they're structured. I mean, as you're talking there, I was a, a friend of mine was down from Megan, uh, sorry, Megan, uh, Megan Wells, a buyer's agent, was down. We were down. For, she was down for a conference, and we were. She said, "Drive me around Sydney. Give me a bit of a tour." And um, we we drove out King Street, Newtown. And I said, "You know, this is a really long stretch of shops. Really long for Sydney. We don't. I mean, Paddington, Oxford Street, we do, and maybe Military Road, but we don't have big long uh, streets with lots and lots and lots of shops. The way Melbourne does. Every time being in Melbourne, you walk in all directions from the CBD. You've got these long, long, long streets." And and I guess is that because of the tram line? I would say yes. Yeah. Because most of the trams were, I mean, they've been around since, you know, end of the 1800s and, uh, and have just intrinsically embedded in the way our city operates. We interest, I've got an interesting anecdote because um, Melbourne and Sydney both had a tram network and basically end of the 1960s, there was a vote because both the cities are kind of saying, oh, you know, we want to be a contemporary city. We want to be car centric. We want to, you know, we love our cars. We love our suburbs. We have a city and a, you know, city we work and suburbs we live. So we'll just go with that as an idea. And exactly the same thing in conversations were happening in Sydney and literally a year apart by one vote, Melbourne voted to keep its tram network. And by one vote, I understand Sydney lost theirs. Wow. Yeah, so interesting. Uh, <laughs> what, I mean, one thing Sydney does have is a train to its airport, though. Um, and so uh, <laughs> yep. I'll say that we've got that down, down pat. But you guys are bringing that. Uh, I think the plan is to have one of those soon. Um, what's some of the things that you think that Melbourne does need to do better at a, at a city level and, um, you know, some things that it needs to learn from mistakes it's made, you know, around the high-density apartments for one, it feels like... Mm. That up. I think one of the things that we're not good at is is the the I guess the skill of what I would call master planning. And I've actually been thinking this really carefully through because every time I'm in Sydney, I'm struck by how difficult it is. You know, it's difficult topography, it's difficult ecology, mm. it's difficult hydraulics, you know, or heights. Is that what it's called? Yeah, your water networks. Mm. It's really hydrology. That's what I'm looking for. <laughs> so it's really hard to build in Sydney. It's easy in Melbourne because we actually just, we're flat. We just keep going. And I think what that's introduced to Sydney is a degree of difficulty on, say, the bigger sites that you 
have to map where's the water going, where's the natural ecology, where is the environmental corridors, where are the good trees, Mm. where are the places that we need to be able, like water to be able to run from the street at the north through to the through to the street at the south, that kind of thing. And what that means is that you have to embed those things in the site before you plan the whole site. Right. What I see in Melbourne, which um, is is quite disturbing to me, is a basement will be dug over the whole site. So every tree goes. The basement goes edge to edge. Then the building is built over the top of that and fills the site. So we lose the ecology, we lose the natural systems that exist within the site. There's a there's an argument, oh, don't worry, we're replacing tree for tree. We've taken out six trees, but we will plant 12 or we'll plant 20. But if you're planting them on top of a car park, it's not the same as planting them into the ground. So I think what we have done wrong is not allowed, is not not required, I guess is the word, not required our big sites to have an incredible, maybe ecologically and environmentally led answer before we plonk the buildings onto the site. There's a, it should be done together. It should be, you know, landscape architects and architects should be working really, really closely to make our buildings and landscapes work together. And I don't think we're great at it. This is that is it called biophilic design or something? Is that what it is? Where you is that is that an architect term for that? Um, oh, well, there is a term for that. They're called biophilics, which I guess yeah, you could say it's it's associated with that. That is kind of about about yeah the the wellness that nature might bring to you, I guess, as an occupant of a site. So it does come into that idea of biophilics. It's, yeah. it's not, I mean, there's places in Sydney that, by the way, have been developed and built exactly the way you've described in Melbourne. I mean, I'm like, sure. <laughs> I, I, I'm sure. I, I think it's all about property prices. I mean, the, interestingly, the higher your property value, the more landscape you can have. <laughs> oh, that's, yeah. Well, I mean, but then every every developer, you know, or every builder says, or you should say, no, every landscape designer that I've ever spoken to has said basically They've got the least amount of money to spend on a site. It's, it's there's not often integrated in terms of the design or the budgeting. You know, from from day dot or every every single thing that goes wrong gets taken out of the landscaping budget. That is very true. <laughs> I it's I know. I feel very sorry for their profession. They're so valuable, and their knowledge of their knowledge of natural systems and the way that a landscape architect can read a site as far as topography goes, level changes those sorts of things, they're, they're just such a valuable voice as part of a consortia. And, um, yeah, they're not always – it is the thing. A tree is so cheap, frankly, so I have no idea why landscape gets taken out. Well, though, you, you, if you take out an established tree and you replace it with two saplings, it's not quite the same, is it? Oh, no. Well, we got that up in Sydney at the moment. They're doing a basically all around the Sydney Harbour Bridge as they're extending all the freeway and I have to drive past it a few times a week and there's this big billboard that says two for one tree replacement and I'm just going, yeah, I don't think that's uh, when you just cut down that huge 50-year-old tree, it's going to take a long time to be replaced. Um, but I thought, I, I think Melbourne's got sustainability higher in its agenda and, you know, it's architects for, and, you know, looking at passive design and using, you know, using uh, smaller spaces and, um, you know, do you think that that's something that other states probably need to lean on more? I feel like that's been more of a priority in Melbourne than other places. Uh, I couldn't really say, actually. I think it's something that I know a lot of a lot of architects, a lot of my colleagues would say, we just have to do this. You know, this is something we are all running really fast in the wrong direction. So it's something um, everyone needs to skill up on and understand and it you know it should be invisible it shouldn't impact what the design kind of looks like there's a whole lot of stuff that you just really need to understand that's what good design looks like you know capturing the warmth from the northern sun those sorts of things um so yeah it's it is important i think i'd be uh bragging to say we're any better than what cindy's doing i think I think we're, I think every architect is struggling slightly because 
there's a perception of sustainability adding cost because we also look at we're, we're sort of short-term thinkers you know even if you think about what it costs to run a place um you know if you don't have to air condition it for half the year mm. then think of your running costs and that's part of the kind of legacy argument is let's not build things that we need to spend so much money servicing it's crazy and there i mean there are there are is work being done across every level of government on and i wish i knew sustainability standards or livability standards i'm not quite sure of the terminology funnily enough i'm being surveyed for this um next week by a representative new south wales government um oh you better bone up I better bone up. Well, I mean, they're asking me, I guess, from, as a professional's <laughs> point of view, you know, what I know. I think that that's probably, um, it's more that they're trying to find out our knowledge gaps, which are huge. But, but um, so there's going to be minimum standards coming in place, right? And and certainly inhabitable standards in the rental space is, is, is a thing, you know, and so this will, I, we've had basics for years, right? So this is about really lifting the game, I'm presuming. Um, and, and again, though, I mean, is, is that, arm of government talking to the chief architect for argument's sake you know what I mean like is it are the various corridors of, of power here are they all working together in synchronicity um I, I think we are all getting to know what each other is doing I my from my own team at the at the government architect's office we have just recently been moved into the department of transport and planning which is a new department so we've been moved in with transport, in with planning, as have planning, because planning was a separate organisation as well. So there's this concept that we that those three arms of government, which is transport, which is not really just transport when you think about it. It's roads, it's walking paths. In Melbourne, it's bike paths, which is huge. So it's our bike networks and it's our public transport, and it's our cars. Um, and we've also, then we introduced planning to it with this idea about livability. So there, those cross-governmental discussions, in a way, have almost all been pulled into this department where, yeah, we're, we're sitting around the table with each other. We're just meeting each other. We've all been working quietly away within our own domains. And now if we have this overarching idea about connectedness and movement around our city, rather than just saying we're talking transport, let's just talk movement, whether that's people, bikes, cars, scooters, those sorts of things. And then we have that issue of livability and community, the demand that we have for a community to really love where they live, um, that idea of how do we put those three things together and make them all work in a really integrated way? So I, I think that the bones certainly are there for these um, interdepartmental discussions that to make sure that there's not a whole lot of people working in silos. Yeah, I mean, Jill, it's been conversations been up for the last few years and as someone on the government level, I'm interested to get your thoughts on this work from home, hybrid work and... Um, how that's going to change the way that we develop our cities and, um, you know, the need to go into the city, but maybe I need to go two days a week and maybe I'm going to be at home three days a week. So I need to use the local communities more. And how is that sort of changing what you guys are doing at a, at a government level when you're thinking about the future of Melbourne? I think it's been um, quite an interesting thing because, I, I mean, we obviously, you know, we, Victoria was so closed down yeah. over over COVID, so 2021, we were really um, working very much from home. Uh, we are world leaders in WFH. Um, but the other thing I thought was quite an interesting outcome of that is this issue of our neighbourhoods and how, uh, to your point, how important our local place became. Mm. And the other thing it highlighted was our our our, our walking tracks, our our suburban walking trails, our n nature, you know, how much, how many trees have I really got that I can go when I step out of my home? Can I get into a, a natural environment, which will help me feel a bit better about myself and step out of my um, 
my enclosed environment. So that issue of nature and um, is a pocket park better than a linear park? Now, we had a lot of discussions about that and we all came to the conclusion that we need linear parks, forget the pocket parks, or you maybe have both. You know, a pocket park is okay when you have a small child that you're trying to keep tabs on or a dog, but it's not good if someone wants to go for a five-kilometre walk. So that idea of having a network of linear um, walking trails is really important. So, yeah, to your point, the, the neighbourhood became a thing again, and I think it emerged, and it probably hadn't been a thing for quite a long time. Although I do think, I mean, Melbourne tends to be a city of that's a whole lot of individual places. You know, St Kilda's different to Paran, is different to Fitzroy, is different to uh, Brunswick, is different to Footscray. Mm -hmm. So I think we've always been a city of neighbourhoods, but I think COVID did uh, kind of highlight that in a lot of ways. Um, I think working from home, that's, I hear good things, bad things. I'm a, I, I like to work from work because I like to be around uh, people that I can talk to and navigate, um, you know, stuff with on a daily basis and, you know, stand around the, the coffee machine and talk that through, that kind of thing. So um, for me, working from home is an interesting thing that we've all tried to navigate. It's great. It's great. The accessibility is fantastic and it works really well in a lot of ways. Governments had to embrace it and governments got the kind of three day to three days in, two days out in Victoria and are trying very hard to encourage people to limit it to that. Um, it possibly has opened up, um, you know, the capacity for regional work for those that, that can do their work in that way. In the world I work in, I think... Um, a lot of discussion is needed. A lot of face-to-face -face conversation is needed as well. Um, we pick up the pen and and draw over the top of people's work, things like that. <laughs> so that you kind of got to be in the same room for things like that. Um, but I think the other thing that I believe has happened in Melbourne is that the city is now a lot busier on the weekend than it is during the week, which is... Um, Interesting. But I mean, I we've slowly, I think slowly Melbourne's come back from having next to no one in this in the CBD to being pretty busy. It feels really busy now. Well, that's Getting good. There was, there was always one of the special things about Melbourne. I mean, Sydney is a bit of a ghost town on the weekends and, and you know, Melbourne was always vibey and, and yeah. I'd Melbourne, it's flat out on weekends. So oh. those that probably work from home come into town on the weekend. Yeah, so it is. It's really busy. Cool. Jill, do you have a, a, an example of a property Dumbo for us, a story that we can we can all take a lesson from? Oh, well, I was going to, um, yeah, give you my personal one because uh, I'm not going to dob anybody else in. It has to be about me. And it's probably, it could be quite typical for a lot of architects because we, um, we're pretty good at finding properties that, no one else wants because they're a bit hard. So we do, I think, you know, a lot of my colleagues have done exactly the same thing. You find the, the dump that is the, um, you know, the renovator's delight and you start work on it and discover you've got, haven't got enough money, haven't got enough time, haven't got enough um, perhaps capacity to navigate your architect partner to come to a decision, which is really hard too. Um <laughs> And so I suppose I, by my, to my embarrassment, I've had three properties that have all been dumps. My poor children grew up in three dumps, uh, never having had a kitchen. Some, we didn't even have a bathroom at one stage. We, we, had, we were enthusiastically waiting for the first Rinai hot water service, you know, instantaneous hot water service to come to Australia because we knew it was coming and we had to wait six months. So we had six months of a Melbourne winter with cold water. <laughs> it was just insane. Yeah. Was it, was it worth the wait though? Or was it, was well, it amazing? was worth the wait. It was, absolutely was. Yeah. Instantaneous hot water. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, so I, I, I am one of many people in my profession who 
have navigated the the dramas of a, a house falling down around your ears and just having to live with it. And designing other people's At, houses that actually and built. <laughs> absolutely. And go, spending a lot of time in, um, yeah, other people's fabulous outcomes. <laughs> Just after this meeting, do you mind if I pop into your bathroom? <laughs> Thanks so much, Jill. It's a good chat. It's uh, it's very interesting because it's so topical at the moment. How are we going to solve a lot of our issues um, as we grow our populations and all the building issues and the government's role in that? So, um, yeah, it's so many uh, stakeholders that are fighting different, you know, pulling different directions at the moment. So it's going to see how it plays out over the next few years. Yep. Yeah. Thank you so much, Jill. It's been a long time coming, this chat. I really appreciate you coming on board. <laughs> no problem. I hope you find some stuff in there to air. <laughs> uh, the lot will go to air, Jill, and I'm sure our listeners will, will give us lots of positive feedback. Thank Great. You. Fantastic. If you have a question that you'd like us to answer in an upcoming Q&A episode, you can send us a voicemail or written question via the website, theelephantintheroom.com.au, or you can email us directly at questions at theelephantintheroom.com.au. If you like what you're hearing, please share this episode with others you feel would benefit. And while you're at it, why not leave us an iTunes review? Five stars would be great. I know that sounds a bit cringy, but we have it on good authority that every review helps make it easier for other people to find out about us and hear what our amazing guests have to say.